Hello and welcome to the first in a series of three slideshow presentations on motivational interviewing for Naturopathic Counseling 3. Immediately following this slideshow, you can then go to the Moodle and complete your online quiz for the week. Some of the key concepts are in this slideshow presentation, so please take note as you are following this. This is just the beginning of our discussion on motivational interviewing, and we'll cover some concepts which I'll explain in a moment. I think the quote that best sums up the principles behind motivational interviewing is this by Goethe. If you treat an individual as he is, he will stay as he is. But if you treat him as if he were what he ought to be and could be, he will become what he ought to be and could be. Take a moment and reflect on that. What does that mean? When we talk about our patients in case preview and review to our colleagues, what are we saying? How do we think of that individual? And what we think of that individual influences how we treat that individual. We'll speak more about this in a moment. So today in this slide presentation, we're going to talk about some perceptions about motivation and change. We'll take a little quiz. We'll talk about the theories behind behavior and writing reflex. We'll talk about some of the key core concepts of motivational interviewing and talk about the six stages of change. We'll talk about developing rapport, which you've already covered in Counseling 1 and 2. We'll do a reflection exercise, and then I will offer you some suggestions for the week to think about and reflect upon. All of these will help you with your midterm paper as well. So let's start with a brief quiz talking about our perceptions about change. So let's start with the first one. Until a patient is motivated to change, we can do nothing. What do you think about that? The answer to this is false. There is a lot of things that we can do with a patient to help motivate them. Um, it is a common thing that we say, and this goes back to the quote by Goethe, we often say, mm, that patient's just not ready to change. And then we do what? How does our behavior influence that change process? We'll talk more about this. True or false, it, it requires a crisis to hit bottom to motivate change. This is often a common belief from many people, that we need to wait until we get diabetes, or they have the heart attack, or they um, have a stroke until someone will change. But that's not true. People can change, and people do change many times before hitting bottom. Think about your own lives. There are many factors that can affect, impact our changing before that. And some of the factors are distress level. You know, that when the increased anxiety about the problem gets so high, we may change. And this can happen prior to hitting a bottom. Critical life events are also important factors that help change us. And the critical life events may not be the actual hitting bottom, but it, and sometimes it can be traumatic enough and serious enough that it, it seems like we're getting close to bottom, but not quite. Uh, losing one's job, um, having a loved one die. And those may not be hitting bottom for ourselves. It might feel like it's hitting bottom. But other things can happen, too. Being fired from a job makes us reevaluate things. Becoming pregnant or getting married. Other life events can help us have pause and reflect. And then we may change. Part of this is about the next one, about cognitive evaluation and appraisal. That uh, when we weigh the pros and cons of change, that can help us move forward and take steps to change. We also recognize recognizing negative consequences can influence us. When we start to realize, wow, if I keep doing this, I may end up with diabetes. If I keep doing this, I see the consequences of this. This is not where I want to go. So recognizing negative consequences can happen without hitting bottom. And then the other factors of positive and negative external incentives, not necessarily the most important one, but it is something that can help. And positive and negative external incentives can be like uh, supportive and empathetic friends and people who try to help us along the way. Getting some support along the way can help us. So we don't have to always hit bottom to change. So think about that. If those things, distress level, critical life events, cognitive evaluation and appraisal, recognizing negative consequences, and positive and negative external incentives can help us, we may not need to hit bottom. 
motivation is influenced by human connection, true or false. And I'm going to say that's true, and this is the basis of motivational interviewing here. While the motivation is solely the responsibility of one person, it can be understood to result from the interaction between individuals and other people or environmental factors. That change happens in a continuum, and motivation can vacillate between two different things. So it often happens within the context of human con connection, which means how we are as practitioners can strongly influence motivation to change. So we talk about resistance to change as a deep-seated defense mechanism. And I would say that that's false. We have tons of defense mechanisms. Freud talked about those denial, rationalization. Um, re resistance and arguing is also a defense mechanism. And we may use these to protect ourselves. But when we say the patient is resistant, when we describe them as unable to change or pejoratively describe them as manipulative, alcoholic, or in denial, what does that do for the patient and how does that impact our treatments? Um, it also creates a power imbalance. We can't empower anyone if we're already seeing them as less than. One of the things we have to recognize with motivation and change is that ambivalence which we will spend a great deal of time talking about. Ambivalence is normal. So we will talk about this more. People choose whether or not they will change. And I will say that, yes, this is true. Um, although change is the responsibility of the patient, and many people change their excessive behaviors without the therapeutic intervention, we can strongly enhance motivation for change. This goes back up to the other one talking about motivation is influenced by human connection. There's a wonderful study that is discussed in motivational interviewing by Miller and Rolnick, and it basically talks about people entering drug and alcohol rehabilitation. They were going to be working with a group of therapists. So what the researchers did is randomly selected people's names, and they categorized them into two groups. They did not tell the patients entering the treatment center that they were categorized this way. They only told the providers. They only told the therapists. They said to the therapist, these people, these 10 people, 20 people, and I don't remember exactly uh, the numbers, these people are highly motivated. But don't tell them that we said that. They took some tests. This is what they are. These people over here, mm, they're highly unmotivated, so just, just be prepared for that. What happened a year later? The people who were described to the therapist as being highly motivated, and it was not true. It was just a randomized trial. The people that were told that they were highly motivated were off their alcohol and drugs, were maintaining jobs, and had better relationships. A year later, in a statistically significant amount compared to the other group that was told that they were highly unmotivated, they didn't fare as well. What does this mean? The impact is... The attitude of the practitioner is so powerful. And even if it's on an unconscious level, we are assuming things about patients. So we need to keep that in check. Readiness for change involves balancing pros and cons. And this is one of the key foundational pieces of motivational interviewing. We say that ambivalence is normal. But in order for change to happen, we have to address ambivalence. So we need to talk about pros and cons. Creating motivation for change usually requires confrontation. Well, this depends on how we describe confrontation. Anytime we are holding up a mirror and making patients look at something, reflecting back, summarizing, that is in a form of confrontation. If we're talking about aggressive, direct confrontation, that seems to cause more resistance in a patient. If I were to tell you, look, this is what you need to do, what happens? Patients balk. Patients resist. Patients start to argue. Doesn't you is not usually helpful at all. How do we do this? Even in our subtle, kind, direct way, we may do this with patients. Here's your treatment plan. This is what you need to do. Come back when you do it. Hmm. 
And denial is not the patient's problem, it's a doctor's skill problem, true or false. From what we'll learn here in motivational interviewing, we'll say denial is not a problem at all. It's not a patient's problem. If a patient is experiencing denial, we need to look at our skills. How do we talk about resistance and ambivalence and conflict? So just looking at these perceptions, what do we believe about change? What comes up for you? Let's talk about some theories about change. You may know all of these on some level. Reactance theory. If, if you are told that you cannot do something because it will do make thing, things worse or whatever, it makes that behavior more desirable. If I tell you, don't go into daddy's study, don't go into daddy's study, that's his special place, you want to go in there. At least I did as a kid. What do we do when we say, gosh, you can't eat dairy anymore, you can't have gluten anymore? Do we present it as this way, or do we talk about what you're moving towards? You know, so how would you approach just what we do in general patient care with talking to people about behavior change? Do you present it as this is really bad for you? You may not present it as that way, but how does your patient hear it? Oh my God, I'm never going to have dairy again. I can't live without dairy. So they tell themselves that certain behaviors are a threat to their livelihood. Then they want it more. Social perception or social psychology theory tells us as a person argues on the behalf of one position, he becomes more committed to it. This happens all the time. And how do we as practitioners increase that? When we start to take a stance, even in a favorable way, you know, you really can do this. Yes, you can. The patient might argue, mm, no, I can't. Ugh, I've failed before. So how we present options to patients is crucial. If it comes out as if we're arguing one position, the patient will often draw a line in the stand and stand by it, and then won't be motivated to change. So we have to look at how we say these things. Self-perception theory. As I hear myself talk, I learn what I believe, and I love this. Um, the more we talk, the more we know what we believe. So that means that when people verbalize thoughts about their level of efficiency and effic efficacy and reasons to change, it can strengthen the likelihood of them engaging that behavior. The more a person's talk, speech, reflects their commitment to change, the more likely it will occur. So be cautious of how you are interacting with your patient and what you're leading the patient out with. How are you getting them to speak about their situation? And this can come up in so many ways. We think we're being helpful and encouraging and becoming a cheerleader. And at that time, we may be helping the patient draw a line in the sand and say, no, I can't do it. If they have some doubt, if we don't speak to that doubt, if we don't speak to that ambivalence and resistance, we'll just increase it. And then this last one is the writing reflex. And this is really important for you to know. The writing reflex, we all have it. We've gone into medicine. I believe all of us have gone in because we want to help people and we want to set things right. We want to help solve problems. But the problem arises in the way we talk to people. When our desire to make things right collides directly with a patient's ambivalence, they will descend, defend their status quo. When we say, yes, you can do it, but they're ambivalent about it and have doubts, they will become more entrenched in their position. And remember, it's the same thing. If a person argues on the behalf of one position, he becomes more committed to it. This can come up in subtle ways. We can say these things in subtle ways, like, um, why don't you try this? Well, have you tried this? Oh, what makes, think, what, what makes you think you can't do it? Yes, you can. You know, so we don't necessarily say things, I haven't heard in the clinic people say things like, why, why don't you want to change? I haven't heard that. Or, how can you tell me you don't have a problem? Come on, why don't you think you have a problem with theory? I, I haven't heard students luckily say things like that, but... That's an example of, example of a well-intentioned, well-meaning writing reflex. And over the course of the week, I really would like you to listen to your own responses. And when is it that you want to make things right? And I just mentioned these things on the last slide about the writing reflex. Colliding with ambivalence, the patient defends status quo. 
Let's talk about some differences of MI, motivational interviewing, from other techniques. It's similar to Rogerian psychotherapy because it's client-centered. It's patient-centered. We want to understand the patient's worldview. That's basically the, in, the whole emphasis, and I would say really the goal, is to understand their worldview. We're not trying to get the patient to change. Now, how many of you are comfortable with that? How comfortable are you going into the situation and not trying to get them to eat right, exercise? If I'm trying to empower the patient, then I see them as an equal, and I really would like them to make healthy choices. But I understand that their choices are based on a whole constellation of situations, thoughts, beliefs, motivations that I don't know fully about. If the patient tells me that they smoke because it's the only thing that decreases their anxiety, am I going to say that I'm going to take that away from them? I had a patient tell me that she ate a quart of ice cream. I still remember this. She had severe arthritis and she was highly allergic to dairy. And when she said, my first reaction was, what, a quart? And she said, yes, it was a quart. It was not a pint of ice cream. It was a quart of ice cream. I would like to empower her to make healthy choices. But in order to do that, I have to understand her worldview. So I didn't care if she ate dairy. I needed to understand that. So rather than say, God, you know, you, you shouldn't do that, or you know better, or wow, that was not the best choice. She's already doing that to herself. Instead, I want to say, well, was it good? What did it do for you? To which she replied, it's the only comfort I have in my life. Wow, maybe that is a healthy choice if that's the only comfort you have in your life. If that's the only thing that keeps you alive. You're going to tell the patient not to eat dairy? Some of you might react by saying, well, you could have them eat soy ice cream or rice ice cream or, you know, coconut. But what are you trying to do there? Is that trying to make it right? Maybe you need to look at something deeper. So we are trying, with motivational interviewing, to elicit, elicit the patient's doubts about change and their and their view of positive aspects of recovery. We don't want to ignore them, and a lot of change strategies do ignore these. We want to listen to what their doubts are, fears are about recovery, about change, and fully bring those out. So, let's talk about some of the core components of motivational interviewing spirit. And in many slideshows I've seen on motivational interviewing, I see these listed all the time. And this comes from Mil Miller and Rolnick as well. The first is autonomy. We really believe in the patient's autonomy. They are free to take or decline information or invitation. It's up to them. Now, how does that fit with the writing reflex? If we're trying to make them do something, do we really think of them as autonomous? It's a collaborative thing. The practitioner does not assume an authoritarian role. Uh, I am an expert in some things. I know some things. The patient knows other things. So we're trying to work in concert with one another. And it's evocative. I am trying to evoke a tone. Um, I want to elicit more information and draw them out. So we need to look at how we are using our language when we're talking to patients. So motivational interviewing spirit. I've already said some of these things. Motivation to change is elicited from the person, not externally. We're trying to shift the person's motivation from an, an extrinsic exterior motivation to an intrinsic motivation. How do we do that? One of the things that's really important is to talk about core values. We'll speak more about this. It's the patient's task, not the doctor's, to articulate and resolve ambivalence. It's not my job to say, well, this is the struggle that I see you're dealing with. It's the, pract the patient's to articulate and to own. And remember, ambivalence is a natural part of the process. Trying to manipulate or persuade a patient is not effective. And I have heard several doctors saying, well, if you don't do this, I'm not going to see you anymore. Now, that could be what's best for them, but it may not be what's best for the patient. 
as we already said, it's an it's a evocative style, a listening information from the patient. And what we're doing is trying to help the person resolve their ambivalence. That's what it is, resolving ambivalence. So our work is never boring. We're always curious, always. And to keep in mind that readiness to change fluctuates based on a myriad of things, one of them being interpersonal interactions. Who are we with? The environment we're in. What's happening around us, our work life, our home life. So it's not a static thing. So many times we get lulled into this sense of security. <gasps> the patient's ready to change, and then they go home. And their environment is one that leads them to go back into some of that ambivalence. They get a payoff for some of their beh behaviors. So to keep in mind that the therapeutic relationship is a partnership and a collaboration. This is just reiterating once again the characteristics of MI. It's guiding, not directing. It's a dance, not a wrestling. We listen more than tell. On that part, I just want to remind you that the studies show that in traditional medicine, it takes how many seconds do you think before the doctor interrupts a patient? 11 seconds. 11 seconds. That's what a recent study said. So it's listening. I also want to point out the principles of naturopathic medicine. We're going to talk about this, that we do not give advice. Now I'm throwing that out there. Giving advice is telling versus listening. Well, we are experts. People come to see us for some information. So what does that mean? That means that we provide information. We do dosere. We are giving information and allowing the patient to respond and finding out what that evokes in them. And this is a collaborative conversation then. So it's not like my patient. I had a patient several years ago, a mother who brought in her two-year-old with chronic otitis media. Uh, seven rounds of antibiotics in two years. They wanted to put tubes in the ears. Now, telling the mother would be, you know, dairy is the main culprit. You need to stop dairy. Now, let's talk about that. Versus, did you know that JAMA came out with a report in the 90s and it said that one of the main causes of otitis media in uh, children was dairy? That's just telling the information. That's sharing the information. That's not telling them what to do. It's sharing that information. And then collaboratively, collaboratively saying, what do you think about that? What comes up? What's evoked in you? And then honoring a person's autonomy to respond to that information in any way they want. So here's the six stages of change, and I ask you to know these. Just know them so you can list them. This will be useful in writing your midterm paper. Just to read them, pre-contemplative, contemplative, preparation, action, maintenance, relapse. I really don't think it's very difficult to memorize those six words and that order. So what are the stages of change? Pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation simply means that the person is not aware that there is a problem or they don't think that their behavior contributes to the problem. Pre-contemplative stage can last forever. The patient says, no, I don't have a problem drinking and they're not willing to move. The goal of the practitioner is to do one thing, to raise doubts. Do you think that there might be a problem? And how do we do this? We can also do this like I elicited with my patient with otitis media. You say to the mother, information. You do docere. Hey, did you know that dairy could be linked to middle ear infections in children? So they can go from pre-contemplative to immediately contemplative or contemplation stage. Wow, I didn't know that. I need to think about that. So then when they're in the contemplation stage, you start talking about pros and cons. What would be the pro of giving up dairy? What would be the con of giving up dairy? What would be the pro of eating dairy? What's the con of eating dairy? There's two sets of pros for any behavior. The pro and con of doing it and the pro and con of not doing it. Once they start thinking about this, and those numbers there within six months, within one, year, one month, within six months, that's usually the information on alcohol and drug rehabilitation. This could be applicable to all healthcare, and it may not be those months. Because you can go from pre-contemplation to contemplation, and then preparation. They're ready to make a plan. And in this stage, when they're there, 
we start looking at obstacles to cure, and we start making a definitive treatment plan. In the action phase, they're doing it. They've done it within the past six months, and we keep addressing the issues that arise in maintaining this behavior in the action phase. What are their coping skills, and how do they avoid putting themselves at risk again? And the maintenance, it's just continuum of, continuing of action. They've been doing this longer than six months. They're getting entrenched in this. They're getting comfortable with these changes. And relapse, just to remind you, relapse is part of every process. It doesn't necessarily happen, but it's part of the process of these six stages. And when we relapse, we can go back to, some people go back to pre-contemplative. Pre nope, I really didn't have a problem at all. So these are the six stages, and I really request that you take a moment and memorize them if you don't mind. So what are the strategies we do in motivational interviewing? And this is something to know as well. And what I'm asking you to know are the ones in bold. The first one says clarifying contracts. And that was not originally part of Miller and Rolnick's strategies, but I will speak to the benefit of that. Then we express empathy develop discrepancies, roll with resistance, and support self-efficacy. We will talk about these in, in more detail. Clarifying contract, that's setting our agenda. And this is just another schemata for this. When we say clarifying contracts, this is really important. What this means which I have another slide on, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, clarifying contracts, we set agenda. Establishing, establishing rapport, this is part of expressing empathy, and that's extremely important. When we explore the importance and values of an importance of behavior change and the, the person's values, and we build confidence, this is part of developing discrepancies and talking about it and rolling with resistance, which I'll explain as well. Our affirming, listening, open-ended questions, self-reflection, all of these listening skills that you learned in Counseling 1 and 2 are really important to help with this process. And in future slides, we will be talking about change talk and the ability of um, assessing the importance of change and confidence. So what do we mean by clarifying contracts? This is where I paused before. Clarifying contracts is important in all kinds of clinical encounters. Clarifying contracts allows you to set up clear expectations for the session. There's three questions I ask all patients when they come in. These three listed here. What prompted you to seek care now? What are your goals? And how will you know when our work is finished? Now, since we work with patients from womb to tomb, our work may never be finished. We understand that on a you know, deeper level. But I ask these questions because we can get different answers. A patient comes in with anxiety. What prompted you to seek care? I'm anxious. What prompted you to seek care now? Well, it's getting too much for me. It's getting too overwhelming. I'm not functioning in my job. What are your goals? Oh, I'd like to get rid of anxiety, but what, what are you hoping will happen here? Well, you'll teach me life skills, or you will give me supplements, or you will teach me breathing. So when you really probe about the goals, you'll find out what they really are looking for. And how will you know when your work is finished? If we really probe evocatively with this, we can find they'll say, well, you know, I'll be breathing better. I'll be going to the gym every day. We might find that the patient gives us the treatment plan. The other important part of clarifying contracts is it explains to the patient what's going to happen in this session. And it gives them authority. We say, this is what we do in this session. How does that sound to you? For example, on the biofeedback shift, we tell patients the first visit is just getting data. We're just going to get data. I tell patients also that I am looking at you all the time. So I am going to continually point out how you're sitting. I'm going to keep asking you questions about how you're breathing. And the purpose of that is to help create awareness. And this is one of the cornerstones of biofeedback. I tell people that this is what you can expect when you come to a first office call and subsequent visits at biofeedback. How does that sound to you? Does that sound like something It's okay? I also explain with them, to them in biofeedback, is that part of the process requires home practice, 20 minutes, 
five out of seven days a week? Is that something that they're open to? And again, this gives them the authority. I explain what we do, they know what they need and what they want to do, and if they're willing to do it. That's the part of clarifying contracts. This is not just applicable to counseling or biofeedback, but all sessions. And if we ask those three questions below, we can see what their needs are as well and see if they fit with what we do. So creating rapport. Uh, creating rapport, very important. And you already have talked about this in your other classes. I just want to take a moment to mention attachment. We create rapport from a neurological level because when a patient has an insecure attachment, an anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, when the patient is not secure in their attachment style, coming to the doctor can be stressful. When they come in and they're already amped up and their limbic system is firing, when we create rapport, it deactivates some of that amygdala firing. It creates a balance where they can then relax. And when the patient feels safe, then they can begin doing the work, whatever the work is. But patients need to feel safe. Creating rapport is a way of creating a secure attachment or teaching secure attachment. And what that means is we value the person, not their behavior. The behavior is not the issue. The person is. Creating a rapport is an ongoing process, although some studies suggest that what happens within the first two to five minutes of a session can set the, the trend for the encounters no matter how many sessions you have with a patient. So how we are when we first meet the patient is fundamental. We create rapport by matching body language, by not just paying attention to patients' words. I think this is what a lot of new practitioners do. We listen to the words people say and we respond to cognitive processes rather than affective ones. We don't read their body language. We don't say, what's happening for you? I see you raising your eyebrows and turning your head. I see you crossing your arms. What's really going on for you? That helps create rapport. It demonstrates that we are really attending to the patient and all your listening skills that you know. And we're going to talk more about that next time. So in this process, we match behavior. We look at body language, their rhythm, their prosody, their way of breathing. And we pay attention to their learning styles. And I mentioned some of this in the last slide. In this slide, I just want to take a brief moment to talk about different styles of individuals. This can fit with Myers-Briggs, or you can look at it in another way as well. This is an interesting thing to try to identify when you're talking to a patient. Are they the theorist? I start with the bottom. Are they theorists, pragmatists, activists, or reflectors? A theorist is somebody who needs to understand the mechanism or the theory behind it. And that's for general constitutions. They might be a theorist in general. But it also is very useful in the contemplative stage, the pre-contemplative and contemplative stage. They need to understand the theory. Now, people who aren't theorists may not really understand that. You, you tell them that otitis media is linked to dairy in the, and it's been shown in the JAMA article, and that's enough for them. They move on. But the theorists will say, how does that happen? What is, how does dairy do that? And so you might need to stop there. Um, the theorists will identify what you, uh, the theorist will try to identify the mechanism of action, and they want to learn. The pragmatists identify how it's relevant to their practice. You know, dairy is linked to otitis media. <gasps> really? Okay, now, now, okay, what does that mean? Okay, I've been giving my child uh, four gallons of dairy a day, or <laughs> we've been eating a ton of cheese. Wow, I got to be really practical about this. And this is useful in the decision stage in making plans and changing behavior by making plans. So in the planning stage, um, this is really important. Activists are doers. They need to try out the experience. So it's most helpful when working at the action level. So when they're taking, they've already planned it, and then when they're taking taking their uh, action, this is where it's really useful. They put practice into action. Um, the interesting thing about activists sometimes is that they need to do, they need to experience it that way. You could think with dairy, the patient's talking about giving up milk. Well, what else is there? 
there's soy, there's almond, there's uh, rice milk. They might want to taste them. So having those in your office could be helpful in the activists. And reflectors reflect on their existing practice. And this is usually useful in the pre-contemplative and early contemplative stages um, where they think about their current behaviors. And they really sit and think, well, am I doing that? Wow, wait a minute, dairy is linked to this? Um, wow, am I doing a lot of dairy? What am I doing? So reflectors reflect on what's worked well and what's worked less well as well. <laughs> as well. You can identify this in patients' speech. So it's just something to play with. Are they an activist, a reflector, a theorist, or a pragmatist? How do they speak? Another way of connecting with patients is to noticing their preferred sense. Is it visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? The visual, they take information in through their eyes. So they need to see graphs. They need to see things in writing. This is one of the reasons I say, always write down your treatment plan. Always write down the things you want them to reflect on, even if it's in counseling. What do you want them to think about this week? Write it down. Someone might be visual. Auditory, they get it by talking. The more they hear themselves speak, the more they know what they believe. This is extremely true for auditory sensors. They listen. And kinesthetics, Kinesthetic people will do it by doing. They need to do and experience it through the feeling. And emotional feelings are really important in making their decision. That doesn't feel right to me. So it's also important to notice people's preferred and dominant style. So we want to create rapport. And in order to do that, we need to listen to our patients. We can use some of these last two slides, tools, understanding if they're visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, and trying to match that. Uh, if they're a theorist, a pragmatist, a um, activist or a reflector, can be really helpful in getting more rapport. This exercise I would like you to take some time and do. You can pause this and do it on your own. You can do this later. And it and, and invite you just to listen or just to read it and then see what you think about it play with it. This is a way of identifying your innate style of thriving and blooming and blossoming and growing and what you need in the therapeutic relationship. This can speak to not just the theorists, pragmatists, activists, uh, uh, reflectors. It's not just this. It's just identifying your personal style and what you might need. And then doing this again with family members, spouses, repeating the process on a different piece of paper with a patient. See if something different comes up. This is a great reflection exercise to help you identify what you might need that's different. So finally, practices and reflections for this week. See if you can notice personal expectations for doctor-patient encounter. What are your expectations from your patients? What are your expectations of yourself? What are your expectations of the session? And do you notice how that's influencing how you communicate with your patient, and hence how you create rapport? Over the week, notice the number of times you, your colleagues, your supervisors impart the attitude, you know, the patient's just not ready, not ready to change. So then do we stop doing anything? What impact does this have, not on the patient, but on you and the encounter and their outcomes? That's also the patient. While working with patients this week and yourselves, identify what stage of change is occurring for the patient. This requires you to identify what the problem is and the specific behavior you believe is contributing to the problem. There's not just one. And also this week, reflect on how do you establish and create rapport? What are you doing? How are you creating limbic resonance, emotional resonance? What are the key factors involved? Just to remind you, some things to remember about motivation. Motivational interviewing, there's six stages. Pre-contemplative, contemplative, preparation, action, maintenance, and relapse. I hope you remember that. Key strategies are expressing empathy, developing discrepancies, rolling with resistance, and self-efficacy. How do we clarify contracts? And what are the skills we use for creating rapport? We will talk more in the next section about ambivalence and resistance. 
After you've listened to this, you may now take your quiz on the Moodle. And good luck!